So today let's explore what's inside of these retro emergency lights. They're basically backup fluorescent fixtures which are meant to light up when the main power goes out. It's not a main lighting, this is only used for power outages and I guess it contains some battery and some fluorescent inverter powering the tube from a low voltage battery. In this one the main goes in here and it's already missing the tube and the cover but I guess there is still enough of it left to explore. It might be partially gutted out, I don't know. Some screws are missing and here's the battery, the inverter, the transformer and the other one. The other one actually has the cover and the tube, but the internals are gutted out already. But I guess I could actually put together out of it one complete unit, which probably could still work, except that I think the battery is going to be completely rotten by now. It's a small 6 volt, 1.3 amp hour, I guess led acid battery. The capacity is measured at 20 hour discharge. There is some cycle use and standby use charging voltage. Less than half amperes. That's the charging current, not the discharging current, I guess. It says 220 volts AC in. And this is obviously a technology of yesterday. The mains comes in through this iron transformer, and the transformer is to charge the battery basically, not to power the tube directly. And I guess there has to be some inverter and another transformer, probably a high frequency transformer, which then powers the tube from the battery. So let's remove these screws and see what's here. And that's it. Some small, probably ferrite transformer, one transistor on a heat sink, and there are some resistors and small capacitors and a diode in the inverter part of it. And I guess this bridge rectifier, together with some of the resistors, is used to charge the battery. Of course, the old batteries like lead acid or nickel cadmium didn't require any complex charging controller. It was just a transformer, a bridge rectifier and a current limiting resistor, sometimes just one diode and nothing else was needed. There is some small transistor here. Of course everybody's screaming make a close-up of the board. 47 microfarad capacitors here, the bridge rectifier, the transformer looks like ferrite core, a TO220 package transistor, resistors, a tiny transistor, LM80 something, or maybe this is some sort of voltage regulator. And here's the board with some indication LED on it. Actually no, the small thing in it is just a transistor. Here's the data sheet of it. Measuring the battery, it's 0.2 something volts. I guess it's a rotten. Let's try to charge it using my small DIY bench power supply. Let's set it to 100 milliamp current limit and increasing the voltage. And it doesn't go into current limiting. It went all the way to 15 volts and this voltage also appears on the battery. This indicates the battery is open circuit. It does not draw any current and it does not pull the voltage down on the power supply. Connecting a current meter in a series doesn't draw anything. If I short the power supply like this, you can see it's limiting to about 100 milliamps. Through the battery, nothing. But at this age I honestly didn't expect anything else than this. These batteries dry out and go open circuit over time. And of course, even if it was working, I wouldn't use it. These are horrible tube destroyers. As you can see, the tube has one end of it quite dark and the other one not. And how often does this actually run? It might have probably made a few hours and the tube is already blackened. Because this never runs it at full power, so it never keeps the electrodes at a proper operating temperature and so the emissive layer is blown off the electrodes super quickly in just several hours instead of several thousand hours, which is the normal life of these tubes. And of course using just a single transistor, it only wears one electrode, because it basically supplies a DC current into it. And of course everybody's screaming the transformer can't produce a DC voltage. Of course it can't, but because it's driven just by one transistor, the AC coming from it is quite non-symmetrical, a spike of high voltage in one polarity and then less voltage in the other polarity, but a longer duration. So something like this comes from it. Which in fact is AC, it doesn't have any DC in it because it sort of cancels out. The area under these pulses is the same as under these pulses. But the tube only ignites in these pulses which have higher voltage and not here where the voltage isn't enough. 
So it's basically an AC voltage coming from the transformer secondary, but the tube sees a DC current and one electrode wears very quickly and also the mercury migrates to one side of the tube and it's running very inefficiently, has a short life and this is just absolutely horrible. But of course they could get away with it because an emergency light for power outages might run just a couple hours a year. It's not like a normal lighting fixture which runs for thousands of hours a year. This thing also seems to have some switch, so you can probably enable it or disable it. And of course the wires are already broken in this one, and the battery also came with the wires disconnected. But let's try to reverse engineer the schematic of it, if I can somehow figure out where the wires went. And here's the schematic of it, the mayonnaise comes in here, here's the transformer, the bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes, the smoothing capacitor, the first one, a diode and another capacitor. And the reason for this diode is to prevent the backfeeding from this battery into here, so that the LED only lights up with the mains power. And also when the mains voltage is present, it turns on this small transistor, and this one disables the oscillator or self-oscillating inverter by pulling the base of the big transistor down. So when there is the mains voltage, it's just charging the battery, and it's not lit, and without the mains voltage, this transistor turns off and this is no longer pulled down. This resistor pulls the base up and it starts oscillating using the feedback. Here is the primary, switched by the collector of the transistor and the feedback winding. The current through the feedback winding goes through this resistor to limit the current. And through these capacitors and into the base. And I guess these two components limit the negative voltage on the base, reducing basically the negative voltage swing, so the base doesn't have that much voltage in reverse. Because every time the transistor suddenly turns off, there is a negative spike on this side of the auxiliary or feedback winding. And of course this was a bit confusing and some wires were broken, so it was harder to reverse engineer. And strangely, the positive of the battery was probably a green wire and negative a red wire for some reason. And I don't really see anything to limit the charging voltage or the charging current for the battery. The current was limited just by the impedance of the transformer and the charging voltage wasn't really regulated. It really just depended on the transformer voltage. And there is a switch in the circuit which can turn it off. But I guess the battery was still being charged. And strangely the tube is not connected just to the secondary. It's connected to the secondary in a series with the primary, plus with the battery voltage superimposed on this. So all three voltages are adding. But why not? It's probably only lighting in one half cycle anyway, and why not add the voltage of the battery on top of this? And also using it as an auto transformer reduces the number of turns necessary on the secondary, because the primary voltage is added. And of course the tube doesn't have any preheat or any starter. It starts with cold electrodes just because the voltage is high enough and at a high frequency the capacitive current also helps with the startup. I'm not sure which side of the tube is blackened because I already took it out and tested it somewhere else. The tube is actually still working. But I really think the life of this tube in this thing is way way shorter than in a normal operation. And the circuitry seems super super cheap. The crappiest way you could make an emergency light back then. Just looking at the board, it's absolutely horrible. But strangely the battery is Panasonic. Maybe it wasn't the first one in it, I don't know. I'm just curious what's the secondary voltage of the transformer. But of course it drops under load. Now it's with no load. It's about 8 volts. And also the transformer is for 220 volts. Now it's 230 volts nominal in mains. Should I try to power this horrible disaster? I connected the tube, I bypassed the switch and I have wires here to simulate the battery using a bench power supply. Okay, let's power it. 5.6 volts. Let's give it about 6.2 volts. It says the current limit is 2 1 amp. It's not limiting. It's drawing about half an amp at this voltage, which basically means it draws about 3 watts only. It's really not running the 8 watt tube at full power. And of course out of the input 3 watts a lot of gets lost in this inverter which is super cheap and inefficient I guess. And the heatsink already is warm. And the tube is super dim. And I have a 2 kV probe here so let's measure what waveform the poor tube is getting. And here's the waveform about 25 kHz. 
and it's actually not as non-symmetrical as I was thinking, but it's not symmetrical either. The duty cycle says about 75%. It stays above zero for about 75% of the time, but also at the same time this pulse is sharper, narrower, this one is wider. There definitely has to be a reason the tube is getting black on one side and not the other. And also the blackening is from running it at a too low power, which leaves the electrodes too cold. At low temperature the emitted electrons are ripping out atoms of the metal from the electrode. And when I turn it on, you can see initially the pulses were a much higher amplitude before the tube started. Off, on again, and it's happening in just one polarity. And the peak voltage is about 200 volts in both polarities, in this one a bit higher. And when I connect it to the power supply the current initially jumps up and then settles down. If I set it to 2 amps current limit. Now it's 2 amp range instead of 1 amp. There is quite an inrush, but it's not probably the capacitors, they are just 47 micro at 6 volts. That's not much of an energy. I guess it draws way more power when the tube is not started. What if the tube fails? I disconnected it to simulate this. Does it self-destruct? It actually draws more without the tube. 1 amp range, about 0.8 amps with no tube which means the entire power, about 5 watts, is dissipated in the inverter. I guess when the tube fails, this thing bakes itself. And of course I should also measure the tube current, not just the voltage. I'm using a 10 ohm sensing resistor here. And now that's the proper measurement. This is the tube voltage, 100 volts per division. And this is the tube current, it's 500 millivolts per division on a 10 ohm resistor, so it's 50 milliamps per division. And the zero is here at this level. It's basically just in one polarity. So it's exactly as I thought. Let's try to insert the tube the other way. And it's actually still almost the same. The current is going in one polarity only and it doesn't depend on which electrode is worn. It's really weird why the tube doesn't conduct in the other polarity. It seems like the voltage in this polarity is enough for it. Let's try to momentarily increase the voltage to 9 volts. And still not conducting in the other polarity, despite the voltage in this polarity is actually higher. And when I remove the tube, well, it's off the scale. What the voltage is 1254 volts peak without the tube. Without the tube there is a very high peak voltage, but in just one polarity, so it seems the tube just never ignites in the other polarity. It almost looks like the tube needs to be ignited in each polarity separately. If I put it in the other way, again conducting in just one polarity. And of course this negative pulse is when the transistor is on, and the rest of it is when the transistor is off. And when the tube is not ignited or removed, there is basically a massive spike the moment the transistor turns off. And this helps to ignite the tube and of course there is no such spike in the other polarity. In the negative polarity not enough voltage to ignite the tube. This is basically working as a flyback. The tube is only passing current when the transistor is off. The tube is conducting in the flyback direction, not the forward direction. This thing is absolutely horrible, but because I like repurposing things, what if I just threw some inductor into it and run it on mains? Of course I'd rather have this housing metal, but let's not be picky. Let's put some inductor into it and maybe some starter of course and let's run it on mains. Deleting this switch because it's not for mains anyway. Let's try to test it. And these inductors are actually for this shape of tubes, but the current might be quite close. The nominal current of this one is 145 or 150 milliamps. Let's see what it does. And this one actually supplies a little bit higher current. Let's try this one. It might be a different current despite it's the same nominal, I guess. This is actually close. And this inductor is... actually even less. But of course the current also fluctuates based on the mains voltage, which is now a bit less than it should be. It's now 230 volts nominal. I remember in the past it was more often higher than lower. Now it actually tends to be below nominal quite often. And these inductors, despite all being the same nominal current, are each of them slightly different. 
So I can actually pick out of them the one that's the closest to the current I need. And it's the nominal minus voltage. This one is actually spot on. I mean, it's running on this one now. This one is a bit higher and this one is even more higher. Which is of course, obviously, because it's meant to be a bit higher current. For the 9 watt tube, it's meant to supply 0.17 amps. And this one needs 0.15 or 0.145. There's actually a different type of inductors for 4, 6 and 8 watt straight tubes, which I don't have. So I'm using these for 5, 7, 9 and 11 watts, which are normally meant to supply a little bit higher current, about 10 or 20% more current, but I'm using the fact that this one is slightly off downwards. So it coincidentally supplies exactly the right current for this one. Now I guess this is the temperature of the winding, maximum 120 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature at which the winding has 100,000 hours life and the delta T is 55 degrees Celsius. That's basically running 55 degrees Celsius above the ambient. And this one has 130 degrees Celsius temperature of the winding, 50 degrees above ambient and I guess this is the abnormal temperature rise. For example, when the starter is stuck and the inductor basically sees more voltage. And to make it even more confusing, this is a 58 watt tube inductor 130 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius temperature rise for normal operation and 35 degrees Celsius temperature rise for the capacitive branch and 75 degrees Celsius temperature rise is probably again the abnormal one and the series compensation capacitor is 5.3 micro or 3.4 micro for a 36 watt tube and also this inductor can run two 18 watt tubes in a series and the temperature rise is 60 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Celsius for the capacitive branch. And 155, is this the temperature rise when the starter is stuck? Does it mean this gets baked when the starter is stuck? And some of these actually say low loss ballast. And of course whether this plastic thing melts or not with this inductor is another question. And of course if somebody's screaming, why don't I just use LEDs? Well, there is no explanation. You either get it or you don't get it. Is the 165 really the abnormal temperature rise or am I getting it wrong? There seems to be quite a lot of information you can't Google. But what I know is that with every extra 10 degrees Celsius temperature of the winding, the life of it halves. And of course this is way, way brighter than with the crappy inverter. And with the loss of the inductor, this thing is drawing about 12 watts, which would be 8 watts for the tube and 4 watts loss in the inductor. Of course, I'm measuring using my DIY wattmeter built into this thing. So that's it then. If you like my videos, please consider supporting my channel on Patreon using the thanks button or subscribing. And big thanks to all of you who already support me, because this channel couldn't exist without you. And I have some electronic driver fixtures, one of them with a battery backup. Should I explore these?